It's my pleasure now to introduce a colleague and a friend uh, to be our speaker today, Dr. Robert Foley Love. Now, in your program, it gives you a bio of Dr. Foley Love. Uh, Bob has uh, been on the faculty at Berkeley and then for the last 25 years, the last uh, 15, I don't know, long time, 25 years on the on faculty of the Mailman School of Public Health at Columbia, where he's worked in HIV and STDs and urban health, prisons and health, and a lot of areas related to community and public health and social determinants of health. Um, interestingly, at the ceremony this morning, uh, Bob also, uh, 50 years ago, uh, when he was an undergraduate at Colgate University, he came to Atlanta to work in the civil rights movement with uh, Congressman John Lewis, where he registered voters and se served as field secretary for the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. And there he worked along Martin Luther King uh, Andrew Young, and, and today's speaker, John Lewis. I've known him because uh, as a colleague, when, he was, when I was at the CDC, he worked very hard in New York City and around the country and around the world in trying to get community and science and medicine and public health together uh, to combat the epidemic. Uh, he was a strong advisor to the CDC when I was there, and after I left the CDC, uh, he had to come in and chair the advisory committee to clean things up uh, for, for AIDS. But he was a, a, a strong leader for HIV uh, for the federal government uh, as an advisor for a long time. He's extremely dedicated to students. He's been a teacher of the year at Columbia's Mailman School of Public Health three times. And he has mentored dozens and dozens and dozens of masters and doctoral students. But mostly, he's really a cool guy, and he's a good friend. Bob Foley Love. It's really hot out here today, right? So small, short speech. <laughs> Dean Curran, friends, family, guests, graduates. Congratulations. So glad to be here. Really, really quite honored, especially because uh, this is the first time in perhaps 30 years that I've had an opportunity to be present at a graduation with someone else who was also in the South, in the Civil Rights Movement, at the same time that I was. For those of you who had an opportunity to hear Congressman Lewis's address this morning, I think you would agree with me that it was a unique piece of oratory. It was one of those moments when he invoked something that I think, for all intents and purposes, has been lost because, as a nation, we are not so much about history. Congressman Lewis grew up in Alabama, and in the early parts of his conversation with graduates, he mentioned what it was like to walk the terrain in Alabama in the 1940s and 1950s and have every step guided, every movement directed, by signs and symbols everywhere, white only, colored only. The, the sense that uh, you were on a terrain where it was very clear that you had no place, you had no possibilities, and you had no future. I myself am a child of the South. I was born in New Orleans, Louisiana, but my father's people are all from Mississippi. So in 1964, when I had a chance to be part of the Mississippi Freedom Summer, it was a sense in which I got a chance to go back. And I'll never forget what it was like to be back in Mississippi 50 years ago, having been there 10 years before, just after the Supreme Court decision about the integration of schools. And recall what it was like to walk alongside my mother, who was doing her best in Yazoo City, Mississippi, to try and make sure that my having been raised in Newark, New Jersey, would not spoil my ability to take in the environment to also understand what was my place. She too was one who was very careful to point out, son, beware what you do with your eyes. Whatever you do, don't look any white person in the eyes. Your father and your grandfather are physicians, but under no circumstance when someone white addresses them by their first names, are you to correct them? That is not your place. I recall leaving Yazoo City at the end of what was supposed to be a Thanksgiving feast, 
scared to death at what I'd seen, what I'd felt, and what I heard. And I recall going back to Newark, New Jersey, feeling a sense of relief that I'd never felt in a city that, uh, for all intents and purposes, was not the most beautiful on the planet and owed so much to the fact that it was in the shadows of New York. Coming back to Mississippi in 1964 with a new vision, with a new set of eyes, with a new set of possibilities, was something that has stayed with me always. And it seems to me that what Congressman Lewis was trying to convey to us this morning was a degree to which, if you think about it carefully, the work that we do, and here I'm speaking specifically to those of us who are part of the public health community, our work is literally all about possibilities. Now this is commencement, so this is a time when you are going to be treated to speeches like mine. They are characterized by soaring oratory. You will hear superlatives over and over and over again. You'll be exhorted to go out and do great things in the world. And then you'll begin your first job in public health. <laughs> and then after a couple of weeks, it'll be you're struggling with the data. You've got a regression model that, for whatever reason, simply will not behave. You can't get the variables to fit, and the theory that you're so bent on testing just seems to be eluding you. Or you're, out, you're like me, you're out in the community. You're working in settings and in situations where periodically you will come across a mother who is clearly in need of prenatal care, but who for a variety of reasons wants nothing to do with the medical establishment. She may be black, she may be Hispanic. She could be from elements of the South where in order to be white means that for all intents and purposes you are the downtrodden minority and everything having to do with your engagement with clinics, with hospitals, and with medical care is fraught with suspicion. And it becomes your job to convince this individual that prevention is after all what public health is about and prenatal care is in your future. Or maybe like me, you'll be in a drug treatment program. You'll be trying to fo convince folk who are obviously at risk for an HIV infection that they need to get tested. You'll be very clear about the fact that uh, you're in a place where the epidemic may be raging. And if you've been sexually active or if you've been careless with your drug use, it becomes oh so very clear that an HIV test might be the window through which you will find your way into treatment and into other possibilities. But the folk you're working with will be afraid. They'll be worried about the toxic knowledge that comes back when a test is positive. And the treatment cascade, which many of you in HIV know about, which means that we're not doing the job that we could be doing or should be doing to get people into treatment or to get their virus appropriately suppressed. That becomes your job. That becomes your reality. And all of the superlatives, all the exhortation that you heard during commencement is basically just an abstraction. It's part of the air. It seems to me that uh, part of what we are confronting is the reality of the fact that public health is not glamorous. It is not an arena in which you're going to make a lot of money. But, but by the way, if you do manage to make a lot of money, my email address is all over the place. Let me know. Let's talk. <laughs> this is not a field where you're likely to gather a lot in the way of uh, fortune and fame. You will, if you're lucky, be someone who is always in the backdrop. You will always be in the wings. But if you are successful, you will know that you are part of what is moving the world closer to our vision of public health, where access to medical care is no longer a privilege, it's a right. I want to say that this is the first of three commencements that I will celebrate this month. This is, for me at least, a crowning achievement because uh, you should see you the way I see you, bright, shiny faces. It is easy to be optimistic just looking at the steely glint in your eyes because I know that uh, you are, in fact, going to make a difference. Our own graduation at Columbia will be next Tuesday, the 20th. But on May 31st, I'm going to be present at a commencement exercise for Bard College. And that commencement will take place at Woodbourne State Correctional Facility. 
a medium security prison in upstate New York, where for the last six semesters, I've been engaged in an interesting effort to get inmates who are about to get out to think through issues of what it would be like to be public health workers. You will see some of them in your future, I am sure, because what we're doing in New York, I think it's about to be mirrored in institutions of correction all over the country. You're gonna to start to see a world where large numbers of states are gonna decide that they can't really afford to keep so many men and women locked up. And it will dawn on them, as it has to my colleagues at Bard College, that a college education and a college degree that is awarded on the inside results in someone who has, get ready for it, a less than 5% chance of being a recidivist. Instead of, as we do in the state of New York, spending $60,000 a year to keep an inmate locked up, we're now gonna to start to see the possibility that not only can folk be educated, but that many of them are perfect for the work that you and I are about to do. Because after all, they're the ones who live in the communities that we frequently describe as medically underserved. They're the ones who are able to talk to folk who are not necessarily the same as us about what it means to become engaged in the enterprise that has captured so much of your life. They're the ones who are actually able to speak the language of other formerly incarcerated persons who are trying their best to be on a low profile and who don't want anything to do with a connection to officialdom. But if officialdom includes being in a hospital or a clinic, dealing with a pre potentially preventable condition, they become part of what we are about. And working with folk who know that population becomes part of our job. In my last class with these guys, I told them, because I'm typically there on Monday, and as you can see, I'm here instead. I told them that I would be coming to address you. And as a consequence, I wasn't gonna be in class. I promised I would make it up. But I asked if they had a message that I should pass on. And the message was very simple. See you soon. <laughs> See you soon. Are we clear that we are all part of a, a rather glorious community? Whatever we lack in fame and fortune, whatever we lack in terms of visibility, whatever we lack in being able to tell folk, yes, I'm a professional public health worker, and have people look at us and say, what exactly is public health? <laughs> and for those of you who had to tell your parents you were going to public health school, not medical school, can I get an amen? My colleagues at Woodbourne know exactly the difference. And because they are part of the community that we are all about to join, I'd like to think of myself as someone who is above all, above all things, an optimist. It is difficult not to believe in the future when I see you, when I see the work, when I see the dedication, when I see all that you've had to do to bring yourselves to this point. Congressman Lewis used it phrase that I recall well from the Civil Rights Movement and from the 1960s. And it applies to you. It goes something like this. You are the folk who will make a way where there is no way. And you'll find a way because that is your way. Let it be not just your way. Let it be your future. Congratulations.